John's Gospel, chapter 5. <coughs> In John chapter 5, Jesus will again put his power on display with what John calls a sign. Now, Jesus did this many times. John's purpose is not to record them all. In fact, he says at the end of his gospel that if he tried to write down everything Jesus did, he didn't think the world could contain the books. And he wants to keep the book short enough to read. So he selects certain signs. Lord, do you, do you remember Pastor Stichler teaching the Gospel of John and saying a selection of certain significant signs and making us learn that? I do. <laughs> but um, he selects certain signs that make a case that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And if you look at what he did with an open mind, the conclusion is inescapable. You will be forced to say with Nathaniel, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. Now, the Holy Spirit will have to do a work in your heart for you to see that. Logic will not do it, though the truth of God's word is supremely logical. But people, as they are born, sinners from their parents all the way back to Adam, are blinded and hardened against God and against his son, Jesus Christ. That's why people do the things they do. They are incapable of exercising logic, especially when it comes to spiritual things. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But God has not left us in that hopeless situation. Praise God. Paul goes on to say, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God, as Peter said, is taking from this dark, blind world a people for his name. That is an amazing thing. You, you would think, wouldn't you, from what Paul says there about human society that it's an impossible thing. Well, so it is. Without God, with God, all things are possible. Even a blind sinner hardened against God, miraculously seeing the light of the world as the Son of God, even that's possible. In Romans 9, we, when we studied that, Paul quotes from Exodus 33, 19, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Now the situation of that quote there is Israel, after seeing God's miraculous delivery from Egypt, has just committed idolatry. They've scorned God. They're ripe for judgment. But God tells Moses, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to have mercy and compassion on them. So Paul concludes there in Romans 9. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Where it was hopeless, now there's hope. Because God chose of his own sovereign will to be merciful because he is compassionate. That's why Jesus came. That's why he did what he did in John chapter 5. That's why the Holy Spirit moved John to record it for us here in his gospel. In chapter 5, we will see this selected sign proving who Jesus is, the Son of God. We'll see a man in desperate need, looking in the completely wrong direction for help. And we'll see him get help that he never imagined. And we'll see Jesus come up against the legalists. Those who thought they could please God by their man-made lists of rules. 
They thought they were doing just fine. Thank you very much. Now, they had nothing for this man who was in such desperate need, but that didn't matter to them. They were doing just fine until they came up against Jesus. And up to now, we've seen Jesus avoid confrontation with them because he, he's on a schedule that will culminate at the cross on the Friday of Passover when all the Passover lambs are going to be slaughtered at the temple. But now, it's time to begin that confrontation that will eventually lead to that supreme moment. Now, we'll consider that confrontation last week, but first, let's look at the sign. Verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, John doesn't say what feast it was because it's not important to the story. The law, remember, required Jewish men to attend Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles. Jesus, Paul says, was born under the law, and he kept the law, kept it perfectly. He kept it for us because we are incapable of keeping the law in its fullness. The last time we saw Jesus in Jerusalem, he claimed ownership of the temple. He restored worship. This time he's going to claim ownership of the Sabbath. He will restore grace. But when Jesus gets there to Jerusalem, he goes to what today we might call a long-term health care facility. Verse 2. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate. Now that's where sheep went into the temple area for all the sacrifices. So it's close to the temple. There was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Why were they there? They were hoping to be healed. And it was a rather forlorn hope. Now, if you're following along in the ESV, the NIV, the NLT, uh, it just stops right there and skips right to verse 5. There's no verse 4 there in your Bible. That's because the oldest manuscripts, the original copies of scripture were written out by hand and copied. The oldest manuscripts do not have the last part of verse 3 or verse 4. The Archbishop of Canterbury gave us the verse numbers many centuries ago. Now, if you're following in the American Standard or the Holman Christian Standard, it will have it in brackets. So we read in verse 3 from the New American Standard. The blind, lame, and withered were, bracket, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then, uh, first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. Ending bracket. Now, from what the man says later to Jesus, it's obvious that's what he was waiting for. Dr. Brisby said it seems wisest for us to accept the fact that something extraordinary kept all those handicapped people at this pool hoping for a cure. There they are, waiting for a cure. What a picture of humanity. How many multiplied millions of people are waiting for a cure? God told Adam that the moment he ate the forbidden fruit, he would die. And he did. He died spiritually by being separated from God. And he began to die physically. The body began to break down until the day when his family watched him take his last breath. And they had to take that decrepit, broken down body and bury it. Now it took a long time for Adam. But over the years, for his descendants, breakdown and disease came faster and faster until people in multiplied millions are waiting for a cure. And for these people there in those roof colonnaded porches, their whole hope is that cure. The people have learned to bring about some cures. We put a lot of money into that, don't we? 
but all of the cures that people come up with are temporary. And none of them addresses people's real need. Not one. The real problem is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If our sin is not dealt with, we miss out on the glory. We will miss out on the wonder and joy of knowing God and being with Him and enjoying Him forever. If we miss that, we are sunk. If our sin is not dealt with, we will be left with nothing but separation from God forever. As we saw in chapter 3, verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Those poor people we see here in John chapter 5, suffering the consequences of Adam's sin, are gathered under the roof porches waiting for a temporary cure. But that's why Jesus went there. God so loved a sick dying the world that he gave his only son. This pool we, we mentioned is in the shadow of the temple complex. Archaeologists have, have dug it up. They've, they've found the foundations of, of the, the pool. Actually, it's kind of two pools put together. They're in the shadow of the temple complex, but none of the priests or the Pharisees who go to the temple would go to this place. This place is full of sick people. Ceremonially defiled people. Don't go there. The Jewish religion had nothing to offer these people. Nothing except the story of an angel coming down to stir up the water at which there was a mad scramble to be the first one to get into the water. And so always, assuming that's what actually happened, the least needy person would always come out the winner. That's why I think the last part of verse 3 and all of verse 4 was not the way John wrote it originally. That mad scramble. Every man for himself. That was not from God. When God heals, he does not do it like that. And I think what we see is a kind of mixture of Greek mythology and traditional Jewish religion. The name Bethesda is kind of a play on words, meaning either house of grace or house of outpouring, you know, outpouring water. It may have been the house of outpouring water, but there was no grace there. In the shadow of the temple, there was no grace. Now, somebody may ask, did an angel really come down, stir up the water so people could be healed? I don't know, but I doubt it. That's personal opinion. But these people certainly believed it. One man waited 38 years for his chance to get in. You know, I mean, for centuries, people have looked to various spring waters for cure. President Roosevelt thought that the hot mineral springs in Arkansas were helping his polio withered legs and he pushed it as a cure and people came by the hundreds and none of them ever were cured of their polio by the hot springs, including him. Felt good, but that's about all there was to it. Whatever people may have believed about the pool and the, the, with the five porches, it was not a house of grace until Jesus came. They waited, shunned and disappointed, trying to heal themselves. You know, water's bubbling up, man scramble, and they're all trying to get in, and the weakest or the furthest behind, and all to no avail. And then, Jesus came. Verse 5, one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. One man. Yeah, that is how God brings people to himself, by grace. 
one at a time. Bringing that one by the action of the Holy Spirit to a place of understanding and faith. People are not saved by being part of a group. They are saved as each one places their faith in Christ and in his finished work on the cross. At one time, the Emperor Constantine, Roman Emperor, decided that the Christian religion was true. Historians debate whether he really believed that or if it was just a political move, but anyway. He marched the Roman legions down to the river to be baptized. Now, it was a relief because that stopped the government's persecution of Christians. But all those legionaries were not born again. And they brought their lost condition into their new religion. And as a result of that, the gospel of justification by faith alone in Christ became buried under a mixture of paganism and Christianity. There have been movements through history when the Holy Spirit has brought many people at one time to Christ, but all of them, all who come to Christ, do so one at a time. One man had been waiting for a cure for 38 years. Now, that doesn't mean he had been at the pool for 38 years. Maybe he was, but he's been waiting for a cure for a long time. Probably most of his life. He's been trying to heal himself all that time. Get me to the pool. And then he waits. And whenever the waters bubble up, there's the mad scramble, and he's probably the last in line. What a dismal, useless effort. What a picture of the whole human race since the fall of man. No wonder John chose this incident to be one of the signs that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? Jesus saw him lying there. What did he see? A man in desperate need. People who were in need through compassion for the Savior. You, you see it through the Gospels. He knew that he had already been there a long time. After all, we saw in chapter 2 that he knew all men. There in chapter 2, he knew the shallowness of people's supposed faith. Here, he knew all about the depth of this man's need. He feels it. And he said to him, do you want to be healed? It's a probably a question. You know, if you suffer long enough, you can lose the will to be cured. Do you want to be healed? Do you, do you have a longing to be healed? If, if Jesus is going to meet his ultimate need, he's going to have to acknowledge that he has a need. He's going to have to see that he needs a Savior. And when Jesus asks a probing question, he's not just applying psychology, he's asking with a promise of help. Verse 7, the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. The man's answer is very revealing. Now, our, our English translations take the Greek words and make it into nice, smooth English sentences to make it easier to understand. But in Koine Greek, word order was used for emphasis. Dr. Wiest in his expanded translation really captures what this man was thinking. Uh, verse 5 in uh, Wiest's expanded translation. Sir, a man I do not have in order that whenever the waters are stirred up, he might throw me at once into the pool. A man I do not have. If I only had a man, that would solve my problem. What a picture of the whole human race. We need a man. We need men and women who can solve problems. That's what we need. We only work together. We can solve the problems of the human race. Well, 
People have been trying to do that through the centuries of human existence. And guess what? It's never worked yet. Yeah, but it might work this time if we just get them all together. Well, they tried that back in Genesis 11. Let's all work together and make a name for ourselves. And they all cooperated in a big project. And God had to step in and stop them. Because the ultimate result would have been interference with God's plan of salvation. Is it ever good for people to work together to solve a problem? Well, don't we gripe about Congress and the legislature because they don't? Mm -hmm. Sure, it's a good thing. You know, it is, it's good to feed hungry children, isn't it? And by focusing narrowly on the problem, steps have been made to get food to children. Like the commercial says, if you, hear, if you ever listen to WJR, you hear this commercial. A person who has hungry only has one need, so let's, uh, a person who's hungry only has one problem, so let's solve it. And that commercial has always bothered me because there are societal problems that lead to hunger. But I understand why they say that in the commercial, because suppose we get together in committees and we sit around and debate how to change society. Would any hungry children ever get fed? No. So, but human problems continue because humanity on its own is incapable of solving them. They are all separated from their creator. That's why they have problems. And only Jesus Christ can solve that ultimate problem. Pastor Tom Tarpley told of being part of a church ministry in Detroit. And they were feeding the hungry. And his responsibility in that church was to help with that effort. But he became concerned because that was all they were doing. He went to the lady who was in charge of that food distribution ministry and said to her, we're feeding their bodies, but we're doing nothing for their souls. He said, she got rid of me quick. <laughs> Tom was concerned because they were not addressing the real problem. Jesus was there at that long-term health care facility to address the real problem. He was not there to make a man walk. He was there to save a man's soul. If making him walk was the whole point, he would have healed everybody who was stuffed under the roof porches. But making him walk was not the point. The point was to perform a sign that would point unmistakably to the fact that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And if the man or anybody else believes that, he will have eternal life. And it won't matter what happens to his body. So Jesus does what only God can do. Verse 8, Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. Now, once again, Dr. Weiss captures it vividly, exactly how Jesus said it. Snatch up your pallet and start walking and keep on walking. And immediately the man became well and snatched up his pallet and went to walking about. No man could do that. The poor guy was waiting for man's help. They were, they were all waiting for man's help. Human help was every man for himself. And that's no help at all. And then God stepped in. And so verse 9, it happened at once. That's an expression that Mark in his gospel uses all the time. At once Jesus did this. Immediately Jesus did that. John doesn't use that expression much. But it does here. Because when the Creator commands something, it happens at once. John wants to be sure there's no mistake in that. It happened all at once. He snatched up his pallet and went to walking about. Now, I, I want to spend some time looking at Jesus' confrontation with the legalists, and we'll do that next week. So I want to skip down to verse 14. He snatched up his pallet, camp bed, light mattress, that kind of thing, 
and went to walking about. And the legalists saw him doing that on the Sabbath day. And they said, what in the world are you doing? It's the Sabbath. You can't carry that. You don't work on the Sabbath day. Talk about that next week. Now, Jesus had dodged out of the way after having told the man to snatch your pallet up and walk. And the man does not know who he is. All he knows is this guy came up to me, asked me if I wanted to be healed, told me snatch up my pallet, start walking, and he did. He doesn't know Jesus. But he must. If he remains in ignorance, the healing will be a waste he will still be facing the problem of his sin. So look at verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. He's been walking around and enjoying life. He even went to the temple. Wow, I can go to the temple now. They wouldn't let me in before because I was viewed as ceremonially defiled, but now I'm not. I go to the temple. But if he doesn't understand what Jesus came for, he will be just like those people Tom Tartley was helping to feed. All for the body, nothing for the soul. If Jesus had not found them, he would have been lost. Jesus found him in order to restore his soul. Now verse 14, I think is a greatly misunderstood verse. A lot of Bible commentators have interpreted it to mean, more than 38 years ago you committed a sin, and so because you committed that sin, you became physically deformed and paralyzed. Now I warn you, don't commit a sin again, or something worse might happen. That interpretation is wrong. It misses the gospel. <clears throat> what Jesus said, and most of the translations miss this, what he said was, no longer continue the practice in sin. He's not talking about inaction leading to a physical condition. He's talking about the man's present spiritual condition. He's lost. He needs a savior. He needs the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That nothing worse may happen. What worse could happen to him if he doesn't believe in Jesus? He could spend eternity separated from God in the place prepared for the devil and his angels. That is far worse than any number of years of paralysis. Don't continue in that condition. As Peter says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Christ came to bring us to God, not leave us in sin. In the man, verse 15, with gratitude in his heart, went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. You're not telling them Jesus to get him in trouble. Kind of like the Samaritan woman. He's sharing the good news with anybody who would listen. Jesus came to do what no man could do. He came to rescue me from sin. And the leaders of the Jews were not happy. Isn't it amazing that there are people who don't like the good news and think it ought to be stopped? We'll look at that next week. Jesus set him free, not from paralysis, but from sin, for the time when he is the throne of grace place. Let's pray. Lord God, how we 
rejoice that you sent your son to die on the cross. We rejoice that we have these pictures of who Jesus is, how he healed this man. But more importantly than the physical healing, he showed him the way, that he was the way, the truth, and the life to them. That this man would believe on you, Lord God. We would hunger and thirst after righteousness and be filled. Help us, Lord God, to be reminded day by day we need you, Lord Jesus. You are the bread of life. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are our Lord and our God. Help us to walk with you in spirit and in truth and to be about your business, O oh Lord. Lord God, we pray for our nation, especially for our state as we have this proposition to have the liberalization of abortion, that we would defeat, see that proposition defeated, that that would bring honor and glory to you, Lord God. For truly you said, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach. And we would pray, Lord God, that we would not be part of the reproach of this nation. Pray to honor you with our lives and the things we do. Pray to bring glory to you, Lord God. So lead us this day to walk with you and this week to regard you as the healer and that we have the truth of eternal life for you dwelling in us. Help us, Lord God, to please you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.